Greg Zimmerman, graduate 1990, 51. Center, long snapper, weak side linebacker my junior year, or Will. I was senior year, mainly played, I played center, started in linebacker too, but we used to move me around and be more of a blitzer. You played under Dennis Etsy. Uh, can you share any memories that you have of Coach Etsy? Um, yeah, Coach Etsy, he was a, he was a tough coach, but he was a fair coach. I feel like he always brought the best out of everybody. Um, you know, I remember all the long days he used to put in, uh, you know, getting there during during the season, getting there early in the morning. He'd be there working out before we got there. I mean, all the film preparation, you know, a bit of a disciplinarian, um, tough at times, hard but fair. I think one of my most fond memories of uh, when he – I don't know if I call it torturing us, but I know after one game in particular, I think it was my senior year, he just kept yelling at us like for – he was very upset about the foolish penalties. So I remember during practice, we just kept having like all these up-downs and like at a certain point we thought he was joking, but he wasn't. He's like, keep laughing. That's three more. Keep laughing. He's like, you guys are going to be doing up-downs all night. So – I think it was in my junior year. We actually won, but once again, it was not. He always wanted perfection of us, you know. Um, so, I don't know. I remember doing something like 60 or 70 up-downs or something like that. It seemed, seemed like something impossible. I mean, I know everybody exaggerates, but I don't think we exaggerated on that. It's just the point, like, you're barely picking your feet off the ground like this. I don't even think you're picking it up. It's just, I don't know. So... Uh, I remember going to him when he was retiring from Middletown. I drove home from out around the Chicago area. And when he was no longer coaching, I remember seeing him at his retirement party. We had a dare at, uh, down by Sunset Golf Course. There was a lot of teammates I haven't seen for a while, a lot of older people. That was that was pretty cool. And we actually went out to, I think, the Blue Room. and Not the Blue Room, but, man, the lamp post or somewhere, somewhere in Middletown. And just having some drinks with him later. You know, I think I always knew growing up that, he would be a pretty fun guy to hang out with, but obviously you couldn't do that when you're in high school. But um, I think he instilled the good values of hard work, uh, um, you know, discipline, being a good teammate, you know, strength in numbers. There was no I in team. So I think that's a, a good concept and a good work ethic. And I think that's why Middletown always excelled far above their individual talent. I know at least the area I went through – I mean, we had some really good players. I mean, but we didn't have a lot of what would I call, you know, high division one elite level players. But we collectively as a team, we played above our individual talent level. And I think that was all from uh, the preparation, the planning, you know, all the film studies, all the stuff and all the hard work, Coach Etsy and all the other great coaches we had. I think we were very fortunate to have a lot of great coaches in Middletown, not only as good teachers, but as good men, good role models. We had a lot of truly great men who cared. Yeah, I mean, Coach Shass was a great coach. Um, coach Pettis, Coach Dickey, Coach Boylan. Um, let's see, who else? Coach Ryder, Bobby Pelletier, um, Coach Fox Jr. I mean, all those guys 
you know, whether it be getting us prepared for film studies, getting us fired up, working on, you know, all the fundamentals and all the techniques. I mean, all those guys gave and, you know, they really cared. They really showed they cared. And all they did is, you know, uh, did their best to help us make us better players. And like I said, not only were they great coaches, they were all great role models for us growing up. So let's talk about game day. What were some things you did? Did you have any routines? Were you superstitious? What was your behavior like in school and like your attitude? Well, I mean, I guess the best part about game day was you always knew what you're going to wear because it was always jeans and your football jersey. So that 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 part was taken care of. It was easy. So, um, and then game day is definitely a game a day you did not want to get in trouble. You did not want to get in trouble on game day because Coach Etsy would be not in the mood to see you in the hallway that day. But, you know, it's just, I don't know. It was always hard getting through the day. You hope you didn't have a lot of, you know, serious tests that day. And it was just like, man, I can't wait for the school bell to get here so I can go home and, you know, eat a light meal, get changed. And there was always that little bit of nerves. So, um, you know, after school would go home, you know, eat something light, you know, not too much, so I won't be throwing it up later. Um, usually pop out the yellow Walkman. I know current players will not know what a Walkman is, you know. Um, usually have my yellow Walkman cassette, and I go through my cassette tapes of, you know, Metallica or Iron Maiden or Slayer or Megadeth. And that was usually my playlist I listened to. And it was just, you know, being either picked up. Uh, I know I used to get a lot of rides with Sean Morrison. He used to pick me up. We used to drive together, you know, to going back to school. And it's just, you know, that whole experience of changing through the locker room where you could hear a pin drop, you know, and everybody, everybody kind of had their little focus. You know, some people were a little bit lighter in attitude. You know, most people just kind of had like that glossy glaze over their face and stuff like that it was just i don't know you're on the i always felt like i was on the borderline of throwing up you always had that butterfly in the stomach and it's just like you could not wait for like the first hit to get here so and once you got the first hit then it's just boom it was all over and then it was just like you're on autopilot or these are the plays these are what we're gonna do so yeah so there's a lot of anticipation a lot of uh i don't want to call it anxiety but i mean you know, until you actually got there on the field, it just seemed like it could never get here, get here quick enough. So, so it's game day. You you've been through school. You're you're in the locker room. You're getting all hyped up. You played at uh, War Memorial Field. What was it like for you running out on that field on game day? Oh man, it was. Uh, I mean, I hate to say you know use a cliche terms, but it was it was. I don't know. It was very electric. You come out, our fans. We had great fans. I mean, you know, fans are always supportive. We traveled well no matter where we went to, you know, going out to the cheers and just, uh, you know, once again, you got all that, you know, we usually get a good talk to by the coaches and get us even fired up more. I mean, I think one time Mr. S even headbutted somebody and he was bleeding from headbutting their helmet, you know, so come out there, go through, go through your lineups. And it was just more, it was just like a crescendo of ever building up, you know, until you get to get that first hit and just get that energy out of you. It was a little different my senior year. Um, at some point uh, after my, well, I think it was after my, uh, after my knee injury, the coach let us bring, the seniors bring, uh, bring them out. So um, that was a little bit different when we got to bring, you know, the seniors, about halfway through the year, get to bring the whole team out. So that was uh, – we got to do the pep talk. So that was that was a little bit interesting at times. So. Can you talk a little bit about the culture that was, that was already established when you got there and throughout your years of Middletown football? I mean, I just uh, – I think the culture was there. I mean, God, it's always been like – Hard work, teamwork, um, you know, like I said, strength in numbers. There's no I in team. I mean, I know all the great teams they had back in the, you know, in the 70s under Coach Yon. I mean, I actually knew Coach Yon personally, not as a coach, 
my oldest uh, brother was friends with his brother and you know i remember going over his house and you know and talking to him and stuff like that and uh you now even uh you know going fishing with him and stuff like that but i knew of of the allure and just uh, i don't know i mean i remember going and watching as a freshman um when our team won districts i remember you know the seniors like uh, that would have been like john schaffner class and uh, Scott Brash and, uh, you know, watching those guys and watching them guys beat Ricky Waters at War Memorial Field where they tackled him on the half yard line to get the two point conversion, for, you know, from, from, from winning. And just, I don't know, I think there was always a good culture instilled of, like I said, you know, hard work, preparation, all the stuff you do in the offseason, the weightlifting, the running, the 40s, you know, the, you know, informal pass throwing sessions and all the stuff like that just you know all the film studies i mean our coaches had teams so well scouted i mean our coaches would know if like such and such lined up here if he was looking this way that means you got one or two plays you know call on and we'd actually call out what the possible plays were at times and that's because all the countless scouting the coaches spent and all the you know I'll say our coaches has re prepared very good. So, and once again, I think that's why our teams, at least during when I played, excelled far above our individual talents. Did you have any favorite uh, Blue Raider players as a kid growing up, or who who were some Blue Raiders that you looked up to? Um, I mean, I guess as a kid, I didn't really know the players as much when I was a younger kid. But as I start getting up into like you know, junior high and, and, you know, in freshman year, I mean, I looked up to a lot of the, the kids I'd already known and, you know, played some ball with in Seven Sorrows. I mean, when I was an underclassman, you know, like I said, I looked up to, you know, like Scott Brash and John Schaffner, or, you know, I had played through with uh, Chad Durr, uh, Scott Sowers. But, you know, when I was a, you know, a sophomore or a freshman, and they were up on varsity. You know, I looked, I looked up to them. That 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 year when I was a freshman, that's that class was a very very good class. They were undefeated that year. Uh, like I said, that had been Dennis, that had been Dennis Moore, I think. Uh, uh, Schaffner, Brash, I think Randy Garman was the center. Uh, Joe Gusler was the quarterback, I believe. You know, Brent Berger was an upperclassman. I just know that team was a really good team. So that was kind of a, a, a really team looked up to. All right. What is something you miss about playing Middletown football? I guess I miss is it's like such a simpler part of time, simpler part of life. You know, I mean, I don't know. I miss the, you know, the memories you made with uh, with people, uh, the friendships, the the mutual suffering, whether it was running the 800 club or running 40s, you know, and uh, up and down, stop and goes, and just, you know, all the stuff we did afterwards, the hanging out, and just, you know, you know, it was a lot of fun. It was such an easy time in life, and everybody tells you that when you're going through that, you don't realize it, and, you know, you don't, now you got to worry about work and kids and bills and travel and just, I don't know. It was a really good time in life. It was just go to school, mm. play football, and, uh, yeah. No social media either. No, that was probably good back then, right? right. You had nothing to worry about, right? Right. You know, I, the most social media I had was my parents' rotary telephone, you know. What teams did you enjoy playing as far as rivalries or, you know, just getting a win against them? Who were the teams you look forward to playing and or beating? Uh, I definitely think re in the regular season, Redland was because we were triple A. And, I mean, uh, Redland was a quad A. So that was one of the bigger teams we played. Um, so always beating them was always, you know, that was always. And I know that always helped for our rating in the Sailor system. McDevitt, obviously, I mean, that was a rival. So always wanted to beat them. When we, I think my junior year we played, that was the first year we played Steel High. So obviously that was a huge rival. So I remember that game playing them up there my junior year. It rained unmercifully. And then unfortunately I didn't, didn't get to play them against my senior year because I had broken my leg. So um, 
And then I would say in the playoffs, I mean, you know, Mannheim Central, they were always a good team to play. Uh, I think we played them my junior year. So that was, and that was a very good game. And then uh, I remember playing against Juniata too in one of the playoffs. Uh, man, they were all them, all them farm boys came out and they all had like beards were like, you know, they all seemed used to like, man, are these kids really 18, 17? So yeah, they had these big mountain beards down to here. So there's always a lure to play them because they were kind of up in the sticks a little bit to speak, but they had some big boys and strong boys, but we always, you know, we held our own and did very good against them. So I, I was fortunate during the time I played football, uh, we've had some really good teams, Been part of some very good teams at Middletown. I uh, even growing up through the system and like play little league seven sorrow. That's how I got to know a lot of my teammates, Scott Everly, Scott Douglas, Brian Huber, Troy Hamilton, Rusty Keating. I mean, these are all kids I played little league football with from the time of Pee Wees up to, you know, basically I played played football with these guys for nine years. Looking at your high school record, uh, just for varsity, you were you played on teams that were thirty-two and five over a three-year span. So that is fantastic. Eighty-seven, eighty-eight, and eighty-nine. Those were, at least during my time as a as a high school student, those were like the that was like the model of success that we wanted for Middletown football. So I think you guys did a tremendous job of basically winning, but also just helping that culture grow and continue on. Greg, you wore number 51. Is there any particular reason you wore that uh, jersey number? I don't, I don't know. I just think it was number. I've always had numbers usually in the 50s. So, and I think, uh, I think that one became available when I was a sophomore because I think Randy Garman wore it his senior year. So that had been our when I was a freshman. So I moved up to varsity. It's like, well, you're center linebacker. So, you know, I mean, obviously one of the best linebackers of all time, Dick Buck has had that number. I think it was number available here, number 50. It's like, okay, cool. That's, that's a good number. I, I just really think everybody coaches in the Middletown area, you know, whether it be Seven Sorrows, Boys Club, junior high, high school. I mean, we have a lot of great coaches. And I think that's, you know, even starting at the young the kids at a young way and bring them up. I mean, I think that's why, you know, I know lately Milltown's maybe had some more stars than they ever had, but, you know, like I said, I always felt one thing about Middletown is we as a team and with, with all the caring, all the, all the stuff the coaches did and helped that we played far above our individual talents. I do need to talk about Greg, your injury. You mentioned it before. Um, sounded pretty bad. Do you mind just uh, talking us through that and how it, how it affected you and how much time you missed? Uh, I mean, yeah, basically that was it for me for the year. It was, this, I think, the seventh game of the year was against Hershey. Um, like I said, I remember recovering a fumble to play before. Uh, and they handed it to the, run, the running back and it just kind of fell his hand. I was blitzing through and it was just kind of one of those things that, like it kind of just came to me. You know, I got it before he did. Boom, shift over on offense because I played both ways. You know, I forget what play we called. I think we called a pass play on first down and then was blocking. I didn't know what happened at the time. And I didn't really know what happened until afterwards when we watched the tape the next, next, uh, you know, we we're watching game tape that week. But um, I just remembering, boom, getting hit and like caroming from the side and like, like kind of like almost not knowing what happened. And I went to sit up. When I went to sit up, like it felt like somebody kicked me in my chest. And then I started screaming and freaking out. And and that was it. That was my season was done. And, you know, in like a second, I didn't know what the hell happened. Uh, you know, coach came on the field, coach, you know, coach, coach Essie, coach Fox, the team doctor. I was able to walk off on my own, you know, and then, 
thought, oh, okay, it's just swollen leg. Went and saw the orthopedic surgeon uh, that our team would see on a Saturday. And my coaches, you know, came in when you do, you know, you do your like working out and training injuries and everybody's looking at it and it's like, well, your knee seems strong and just seemed swollen. Went and saw the earth coaches drove me to see the earth peak surgeon on a Saturday, at whatever game he was covering. And they're like, come in my office on Monday. So on Monday, I know it was me, Scott Douglas, who was beat up. Uh, Scott Everly was beat up. We all went over there and got a surgeon is like, huh, your leg's still really swollen a lot. And then um, he's like, he took some accurate x-rays and it's like, it's too cloudy. We're going to have to take some fluid off you. So I remember him taking out this turkey based needle like like this big and screwing it in my knee and sucking out a bunch of, I don't know, it looked like a combination of olive oil with food coloring, squirting into a pan leaving the needle in as he unscrewed the syringe and then screwing it back in and taking more. And it felt like he was sucking my tendons dry. And so they drained it off. I think they took off like 100 cc's of fluid from my left knee and then uh, took some more x-rays and then comes back. He's like, Fred, I got some bad news for you. I was like, you've got a fraction of a femur. And like, I just, I like lost it. Like, I mean, I start crying. Like, that was like, I don't know. I mean, you would know. I mean, like, you know, all those years, all those 40s, all those wind sprints, all that time this summer, five years of Little League, four years of high school, everything's supposed to be towards your senior season. That's supposed to be everything. You're supposed to enjoy every second of it. So um, it was hard. It was hard to take. It was hard to process. And I definitely, you know, got a little bit down on myself, a little bit depressed. But like I said, combination – I, I just remember coming back, you know, it was rough driving back. And the first person who had a degree was Coach NC. And he just, like, rushed up and gave me a hug. So, it made me feel good. After that, um, one thing that happened is just to try to keep me involved. Coach Essie had me call the defenses. So, like, I would, you know, he would actually let me, he'd tell me what to call. I would signal and now learn all the hand signal. Obviously, he knew him as being a linebacker, could be in the captain and being a linebacker, call the defenses anyways. But, you know, I would call him in to, to the team. And that was just his way to try to keep me involved because, you know, you know, how important football was to me in, in high school and how, how much of a part it was in my life. And, I think he tried to do that to not help me get depressed, so to speak, you know. Um, and another thing my teammates did, it was very nice uh, gesture, was uh, uh, one of the uh, – Mark Wasileski, his dad, uh, got numbers printed off, and then all my teammates wore my – like my helmet on their number. It was kind of like a tribute. So so that was that was a very nice gesture, uh, you know, on both on coach's part and both on my teammates' part. Ideally, would have hoped if we would have went on – long enough that I could have got back in, you know, if, but realistically, I mean, only if we'd have went for, way far enough in the playoffs. Cause I mean, my recovery, it was still like, I don't know. I had a walking brace for, I had a cast for four weeks and I had a walking brace for four weeks. So it was probably more of a pipe dream or just try to keep me like, you know, involved. But like I said, you know, coach, Coach having me call plays during practice and then, you know, defensive plays, stuff like that, even some during the games was keeping me involved. And then, you know, guys putting, you know, my numbers on the helmet and then allowing us seniors to bring them out in the field with a pep talk, all that stuff. And that just speaks for, you know, Coach Etsy's caring and his, you know, his character and what really good person he is. You know, I probably set the record for most profanities uttered for a pep talk, you know, getting guys out there. but. Guys seem like they got fired up, so. But I don't know if they can understand a word I said, but they seem like they got fired up a little bit, so. We lost Zimmy the last two, three games of the season when he broke his leg. Mm -hmm. And then he would give speeches to the guys and he'd be in tears every game. You were a captain. Do you mind just touching on that and maybe who your other captains were and what that was like? Uh, yeah, the captains were me, Scott Everly, and Brian Boyd. I mean, Brian Boyd was my best friend in high school. 
I spent the majority of time hanging out with him, and I spent a lot of time hanging out with Scott Douglas, too. God, I played with Scott ever since. God, I think I played T-ball with him. Played seven sorrows football with him. Uh, so I knew Scott a long time. We were good friends. Um, I mean, Scott was probably the best. Everly was probably the best natural talent athlete I ever saw. I mean, you know, even uh, stuff you do, even as a little kid was amazing. Like, you know, just, I don't know. He was probably the best athlete I've ever seen in my time. You know, baseball, uh, football, basketball, track. And I mean, you know, I mean, he's got a muscle on him, but he wasn't overall a very big, very big kid. But he was he was a tough kid, too. I mean, he was tough. He could hit. And I remember one time in high school, we were doing one of those drills, you know. I think it's, I can't, I can't remember what the drill is, where you line up, where you put the bags on one side. You have one guy blocking the defender, and you have the linebacker running. And, like, I mean, me and him just hit each other. It was like two bulls hitting each other. And, like, eventually, like, we were getting ready to, almost to the point I think we were going to start – start fighting but like coach it just like broke us up and we just all laughed about it i mean i can only imagine what he would have done i mean our offense was you know no disrespect to anybody any program anywhere but all we were we were a different type of team there it was you know delaware wing t three yards in the cloud of dust or whatever and but we spread the ball out i mean my senior year i think scott had 1600 yards maybe rushing i don't know like don't quote me stats but i know he had mid mid thousands 15 16 tom maxwell had almost a thousand yards of fullback you know rusty keating the quarterback had mid thousands as passing i mean if we i can only imagine what if we'd done if we'd ran spread offense you know and stuff like that and back then a lot of times especially my senior year most of us guys were out by by mid third quarter so you know and coach as you not once again not saying how programs are or anything like that but I mean, we never really, except Northern, we did. But, I mean, we even had the second string in half against Northern. You know, it's just they just didn't have a great team that year. I mean, I think a lot of our games could have been like that had they kept everybody in in the whole way. And, obviously, everybody's stats would be up there. But I would put Scott against any running back Middletown ever had, you know, past, present, future, no matter what their stats are. I know there's been some great players come out of there as of late. And, like I said, that's no disrespect. It's just – who I played with, knowing how tough he was, you know, how good he was, his instincts, you know. He was a, he was one of the best players in Middletown football history. And I had a lot of good friends, um, you know. We had a lot of great players. We had a lot of great one-year players. Um, you know, some, some people, because of the way things were, didn't get as much chance to play until their senior year. And, I mean, I, I don't know how it was during your time, but we had a lot of kids and, you know, really played amazing just one year. It might have been your senior year, you know. When we go into 1988, okay, so this is one of one of the most famous years in middle football history. You got Brian B. Secker and Scott Souders as the captains, finished 12-2 and two on the year. Um, beat McDevitt at home. Opened up that, that season with that win. Also beat Central Dolphin, Lower Dolphin, Palmyra. There was a 14-12 to 12 loss against Redland. Yeah. I remember uh, I remember at the beginning of the year, uh, I was getting playing time but didn't start. And uh, um, I know after we lost to Redland, we kind of retooled our defense, moved a couple people around. I know I think we moved Mike Zuby to DN. They moved Brian Boyd to D-tackle, and then I started playing weak side linebacker, started at weak side linebacker. So I didn't really start that year, and same with Brian Boyd until after the Redland game. All right, and so then after that Redland game, I mean, just looking at the scores here, obviously something was working because you guys started handling some business here. Beat Northern 42 nothing, Hershey 48 nothing, Mechanicsburg 48 to 7. Milton Hershey 28 to 14, um, Steel High 20 to 8, and that was, that was a very sloppy game. Steel High, we played up there, and it was raining like crazy. I was long snapping too, and I remember at the end of the game on a punt, I asked the referee to wipe off the ball. He's like, "What difference does it make?" And he wiped the ball off me. I was like, "You 
son of a gun, you. So, and he just handed me a wet ball. I'm like, seriously? <laughs> like, I just remember trying to get the snap best I could. So, but yeah. So those years, um, for your era, you were 2-0 and against Steel High, which not a lot of people can say in middle town football history. So little little nugget there to be proud of. All right, and then you finish out the regular season with East Pennsboro. You beat them 29-7. to And then this is kind of interesting. You guys are in playoffs now, and – you're playing against Juniata, but it's also at East Pennsboro. So two weeks in a row, you guys played at East Pennsboro's field. Um, but let's talk about that Juniata game. Um, you mentioned some things earlier, but what what do you remember about that that play? I, I just remember their whole team seemed huge. You know, like they seemed big. They all had beards. You know, and just like they all had like mountain beards. Like, man, where do they grow these kids so big? I mean, I wasn't that. I wasn't. I wasn't big my junior year. I was only 100 and I think like 172 pounds. So, but uh, yeah, it was very, I, they ran more of a physical, I mean, they were very physical. And uh, I just, I can't remember what was the score of the game. 21-7. Yeah, it was, it was a tough game. And I don't really think we pulled away until like the very end, but it was a, it was a tough, it was a hard fought game. I mean, it was probably one of the most physical games we played that year, probably besides, uh, I don't know, probably besides Berwick in the playoffs. So, okay. And then next, you guys <clears throat> went up against a Division three powerhouse, Mannheim Central, coached by Mike Williams. Yeah. Very solid program. Yeah. And as you guys, Handled your business and got a thirty-three to seven win for the district championship. You remember anything about that game? I mean, yeah, I just know we weren't favorites at all. You know, and of course, I think Coach S used that for bulletin board material to get us all fired up during the week. And just, I don't know, it was one of those games where we came out and it just seemed like everything clicked. You know, we were a well-oiled machine. You know, I, I don't really think. You know, I can't remember quite how this how the score went but by the score would indicate we we did pretty good and I just don't think they were ready for as good as we prepared and just I don't know you know sometimes it just seems like everything falls in place and that that was one of those games so offense defense special teams you know coaches did a fantastic job of scouting them out and knowing their tendencies and you know we did we did good and studied hard and we were well prepared if I remember correctly, I, I believe uh, their coach, Mike Williams, said you guys were the most physical team they've ever played that year. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that's one thing about Middletown. It always had a history or a uh, uh, history of, of, you know, being a very physical team. You know, I'd say physical and well-prepared, you know, so – well coached, well disciplined. And that takes us to the Eastern Finals game against Berwick. Um, definitely a very famous moment in Middletown football history. This is the state Eastern Finals. You're going up against a program with a, with a lot of history in Berwick. They had a stud quarterback, Jake Kelchner. Um, and this was in early December, so it's, you know, it's pretty cold out. A um, little bit of controversy in the game. The game is actually still on YouTube for those, those of you out there that may want to check it out. Um, but at this point, as far as my research has shown, this is the farthest Middletown football has gone um, in the playoffs to, to date. And they almost pulled it out. They were very close. But, Greg, what do you remember about this Berwick game? Man, I just remember, I mean, it was, a, it was a very, very physical game. It was a hard game. I remember driving up there on the bus ride to Bethlehem. Um, I think that's where it was, where we played it at. Um, I mean, we had – our fans traveled well. Their fans traveled well. Um, it was cold. I mean, they were, they were a great team. 
I mean, I, I don't know what they ended up, but they ended up pretty high in the country that year, USA Today. I don't know if it was four or three or what. I mean, they had all the history. Um, yeah, I just remember it was a hard fought, hard, hard fought game. I mean, we had some people not at our best. I remember Tad Schultes had a, like a real big club on his hand because he had broke his hand. So that that definitely affected his play a little bit as far as pass blocking and stuff like that. Um, I mean, Jake Kelsner was you know a tremendous high school quarterback. I mean, he was you know he was a big kid. I mean, Berwick had a very good history because obviously they had Ron Paulus after that of having good quarterbacks. But I don't know. He was probably 6'2", 6'3", 225. And, you know, when you're 5'9", probably lying a half inch on there and you're 172 pounds and you can't arm tackle him. So I remember it was a newspaper clipping. Unfortunately, it was me grab or reaching out like this, grabbing him, missing him. There was some controversy on some plays there, uh, maybe a possible pass interference and one where, you know, one of their wide receivers looked like he picked the ball off the ground. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think you can go on YouTube and watch it. It's one of those questionable calls, and I, I don't know. Just I just know it was two evenly matched teams, hard fought, a lot of hitting, a lot of hitting in the trenches. You know, it was – probably the most physical game I've ever played. So, and one of the most very disappointing games I've ever played <laughs> too. So that was a long ass bus ride on the way home being upset. Wow. Dad. At least we got to eat someplace good afterwards on the charter. Bus, so I was going to ask you if you remembered the bus yes, ride. Home. I mean, you could have heard a pin drop. Like nobody, nobody said a word. So, I mean, it, kind of hard to keep perspective you know how good we did you know at the time you don't tend to look at it but you know I mean we we achieved a lot we played a great, great team and when you play you know when you give it all your all there's nothing to be ashamed about win lose or draw so so that goes into 1989 um you just had a fantastic year eastern semifinals almost made it to the state championship um you got Scott Everly coming back. You got Brett Bo or Brian Boyd. It's your senior year. You, you end up 11 and 1. Um, start out the season, you beat McDevitt. Um, beat, you handle Central Dolphin pretty well. You handle Lower Dolphin. And you just keep running off victories. Palmyra, Redland, Northern, you beat 59 to nothing on homecoming. Hershey, you handle. Mechanicsburg and Milton Hershey, you shut out. You wallop Steel High, you beat East Pennsboro real bad, and boom, you guys are back in the playoffs, um, going up against an Elizabethtown team that had some studs on their team as well. Um, can you walk us through any of these games or this season, and then we'll get into the Elizabethtown game? Yeah, I mean, I remember McDevitt, we played up there on a Saturday afternoon. It was so hot up there. I mean, it was a hard-fought game back and forth. I remember I, I think I was lucky enough to get an interception in one of the quarters. And I think I think Tom Maxwell may actually have scored later on on that drive. We ended up beating them six nothing. But I mean, the thing that sticks out most in that game to me, besides like diving and getting an interception when I had didn't have the most adroit hands in the world. They were more like bricks. Um I remember coming in at halftime and being so hot. I just remember taking off my pads and like sitting in the shower with the shower running over me because like I was, I mean, I was so hot. Just it was a very, very hot game. So, but yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, that was one of those rivals, Steel High, McDevitt. You hated them teams. You know, obviously you hated McDevitt for other reasons, you know, because they had so many good players coming from there and you're always wondering like, Oh, how do all these division one running backs just always end up in McDevitt, you know? So, so that was that, that game stuck out early on. So. All right. And then let's, let's go into the uh, Elizabeth town game. So. Oh, unfortunately by that point I wasn't playing. So, uh, you know, I don't know. We had a lot of injury. I mean, we had a lot of people get injured towards the end of the year. You know, I mean, every team has to play with it, though. So, um, 
they had a very, uh, you know, after I got hurt, we went more to a double rover type of defense. So um, they had a very, they had two really good running backs, I think, at the time. So it was, it was, it was a pretty physical game, and just we, I don't think we could contain the running. And then, you know, I think Doug Hunter got hurt during the game. Uh, Scott Everly got hurt during the game and just, you know, we were down and just, they just played better up than us that day. So he was, he was probably, I'd say he was probably one of the toughest guys pound for pound ever. I mean, once again, I knew Chad, you know, uh, younger too, growing up baseball, football and stuff like that. And I mean, Chad was a great athlete. I mean, you know, small, probably one of the smaller quarterbacks ever, you know, we ever had there. I mean, I don't think Chad was 5'6", five, 5'7", five, but man, I'll tell you what, when Chad come around the end and decided to keep the ball and run, I mean, he'd hit you as hard as any fullback. So I think at one point they actually put, maybe his sophomore year or whatever, they put Chad in his nose guard, you know, so I'm going against, you know, all these big ass centers and stuff. So, but yeah. Chow was a good person, great quarterback, uh, great athlete. I know he's very good in baseball. Um, just, yeah, I mean, like, he was one of those persons, he'd come out, he would take control, good leader, he'd take control of the huddle, pull everybody together, never got down on anybody, never said a bad word. I mean, he was a great teammate, you know. He was one of the persons you could look to for guidance and, you know, pull together, make you play better. Greg Zimmerman, class of 1990, uh, senior year was a captain, 32-5 uh, and five record overall in his three years of Middletown Football High School. I thank you very much for your time. Uh, wish you the best, and I hope you have a good holiday season. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate it. Merry Christmas and a happy new year. Stay safe. Is there any other relevant information that you want to share about Middletown football. You need to play every play like it's your last because you never know literally when that's going to be. So it sounds very cliche, but, you know, just like life, you really need to live, live every day like it's your last because we all have limited time and we don't know when it's going to be, so. Hey, what the hell? So. <laughs> All right, good. That's my, that's my best one there. So probably if I had a couple drinks, I could do it better, but it's off the top there. So. <laughs>